improvising is kind of uh, my background. Um, you know, as much uh, other stuff as I've done, uh, I feel like my formative artistic years kind of came up in that headspace. Um, so I think that actually was part of why I moved away from it for a certain time, right? Just sort of exploring other spaces like composing and things like this. Um, I also was involved in a pretty long-standing uh, duet uh, with a friend of mine and he ended up moving away and so I my identity at that time my playing identity was so bound up in this particular playing engagement that that also created sort of a natural like shift away from that right um, as to why I got back um, there are a lot of answers uh, none of which are particularly single singular or effective um, uh, I'm sort of in a space right now where I feel like I'm trying to reevaluate uh, how I spend my time, uh, frankly, and part of that is looking at what I actually care about. And uh, one of the things that I really love about art in general is the communal and social aspect. Right? Um, and improvising is an inherently social uh, activity. And it sort of is very egalitarian, right? Like everyone uh, is on, I mean, it doesn't always bear out this way in practice, right? But playing relationships, the people within them are generally speaking on equal footing, right? As opposed to something like composing, right? Where a sort of composer-performer relationship has to work to be non-hierarchical and to be mutual, right? And I think that that's, um, possible for sure, but it just takes the right people and the right circumstances and the right commitment, for example. Whereas playing doesn't necessarily have that kind of a problem, um, especially in a like a non-idiomatic context, right? Like in jazz, drummer does this thing, like a trumpeter is, does this thing, right? But with kind of the improvising that we do, uh, it's much less fixed. So uh, in ma many respects, sort of... Uh, non-artistic <laughs> reasons uh, that have sort of led me back to playing. Um, also, uh, just being engaged with something uh, physical. Um, my background's in athletics, as anyone who gets within earshot of me knows. Um, and so, as much as I like mental disciplines, um, I've just found it really interesting to get back into a physical discipline. So can you talk a little bit about the, the physicality of playing like like when you actually play you play in a very or at least in the past um very physical manner and is that something that was conscious is not the right word but like how do you relate to um capital p physicality in terms of, of your playing like need it be so physical like is is that um an outgrowth of an athletic background is it a, an outgrowth of what it is you're looking for in that kind of product like just physicality what, what's up right no i mean you know it's uh, because what i'm doing is basically an amplified symbol on the floor and then i have other objects that i'm sort of bringing on and off of it so it's an instrument without a fixed identity um and so there aren't uh let's say assumptions that i can make about my body right like if one is a cellist, for instance, or any kind of instrumentalist, um, you're all my. When I was training to be a drummer, for example, my goal was to sort of neutralize the physical element and to just um, skip that stage in a certain kind of way and to have the sound right and then the action um, and sort of have that be seamless. Whereas now, the nature of my instrument is non-repeatable. It's a lot of these. Um, transient states, right, where I have different hand positions or stacks of objects or whatever, um, and I'm sort of negotiating these in real time. Um, and so you just are more aware of your body at that point, right, on a sort of basic level, because, uh, again, you can't necessarily fall back on habit or assumption or these kinds of things. Each state, there's a lot of unique states, it generates a lot of unique states. Um, so it makes you very conscious of your body and of your physical engagement with the instrument. Um, and then uh, I think I just, I find that when I get preoccupied in the act of making sound, um, it is a bodily and visceral experience. It's something that I struggle with, to be perfectly frank, because 
Um, I, I think it can kind of get hammy, right? Like um, the improviser, like closing his eyes and sweating and like moving really fast, like that can be very masturbatory or self-indulgent or at least appear to be that way in a way that is detrimental to the perception or reception of music. Um, and so that's something that I try to avoid or at least try to be conscious of. Um, but like playing feels good and moving and pressure, these things feel good. Um, and there is something uh, of immediate aesthetic import to these qualities of doing what I do. Um, you talked about the, the social aspects or the interaction aspects of improvisation and specifically like with non-hierarchy. But how do you negotiate that uh, in a solo context? Like, do you do you lean away from playing solo? What like what do these things mean when it's just you on your own? Yeah, no, it's it's a really interesting question, and it is something that I struggle with right now because um, I find uh, myself <laughs> I get sick of myself playing very quickly. Um, and so the nature of the music itself reflects that because there's a lot of change and a lot of brevity um, or sort of cadences. Um, there's a lot of cadences. Um, and I, I lately, as I've had opportunities to perform solo, I've had to very consciously be like, well, like, let's just assume that people are here because they want to be, and if they don't want to be, they'll leave. <laughs> and I'm not a terrible person for it. Um, and really focusing on playing and making a thing. But it's, it's frankly something that I struggle with quite a lot um, because I'll do something for three to five minutes and just kind of be like, well, I've done the thing, right? So I think part of it actually, um, the mental hurdles that I'm working through right now is that I think that itself can be very selfish, right? I know a thing, so it ceases to be interesting or worthwhile to me when in fact it's not simply about my familiarity with my playing and my sound world, but like maybe that can be worthwhile for someone else, right? Um, so not making the decision for other people that they're sick of my playing, um, but trying to at least provide the opportunity for someone to take it or leave it, as it were. So the on it was like maybe the first or second night that you were here, like we had set up in the room and you had come back to the room in the evening and you just kind of had the windows open and you were just playing boat symbol, just kind of like eyes semi closed, just kind of looking out um, into the valley. Like just you were playing by yourself for no one. Right. <laughs> um, so what what is that? Um, how do you how does that relate to what you're talking about here? Like what are right. these? Because you're a, a lot of what you're talking about in terms of like non hierarchy had to do with still a relationship to audience or, mm. or listener whether or not it's, it's another person, what does that mean when it's just you? Like literally just you, as, as like it was the other day. What were you doing then? <laughs> Therapy? <laughs> 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 um, it was, I, but actually, no, it was, you know, I mean, uh, this is a very particular location that is um, very visually beautiful, but actually more importantly is um, just the little, like being in the place, interacting with people here, um, it's a kind of place that I would like to know. Right. Um, and so it was kind of, I mean, this is a very romantic and silly way of framing it. So I apologize in advance for that. But uh, to a certain degree, it was like a way to just like be intimate with the place, like spend some time with the place. Right. Um, spend some time with my head uh, and just look. I mean, it was really an interesting experience because a good portion of the time, my focus, my attention was on what I was seeing. Right. Like the, the hands were kind of doing their thing. I was listening to a certain extent, but it was really like, oh, there's a shooting star, right? Like just kind of looking over the valley and, and taking it in. Um, so it was, I guess, a very um, private thing, right? Um, and feeling as though the act of being active uh, was a mediator through which one can understand the experience as opposed to just looking right um, I think we get onto some un some uh, ineffable ground there uh, but I do think there's something to being active right as helping like for example me digest the visual of a place or the sense of being in a place 
it, I mean, I guess to follow up on that is is active specifically mean related to like an aesthetic experience, or or could you that could that have been a walk? Could that have been? Um, is it the same when you're stretching or doing yoga? Like, what does active mean in in terms of the ineffability? Like, with specifically what you're on about there. Well, so the the analogy that always comes to mind for me uh, is disc golf, uh, which I'm really active in. <laughs> How long can it be until I shoehorn disc golf in the conversation? Um, but one of the things that I found, so for example, I'm someone who's never been inclined to hiking. Um, I understand that. The act of hiking is a literally active experience in that I'm moving my feet and traversing a place. But the things about hiking that seem to be interesting to me, um, I experience as passive. I'm looking and receiving. Right? Um, and so it's just frankly never been something, and this is just a failing on my part, uh, never been something that has been able to really hold my attention for protract protracted periods of time. Um, Whereas disc golf, a lot of the spaces that disc golf occurs in are outside, right? Um, are often in interesting and maybe like not entirely human friendly uh, terrain. Um, and uh, I, so there's these beautiful spaces, and I found that um, conceiving of a space, conceiving of a trajectory through a space becomes a very proactive contemplation of that space, right? Um, that oftentimes, uh, is a product of a specific location. So um, the experience of playing in the mountains of Western California is different than the experience of playing on a hillside uh, in uh, North Carolina, is different than the experience of playing in a sort of reclaimed or first claimed swamp in Louisiana. These are particular places that have particular characteristics and in playing a game that is basically about moving through those things, uh, excuse me, moving through those spaces, um, you know a place, right? Um, and you're forced to engage with and digest a place. Um, so it's this proactivity, it's this activity, right? Um, that becomes a, that bridges the gap between yourself and the space uh, and the place and the environment, right? And the habitat. Um, and so I think there's some corollary there in playing and playing in, uh, which is something that I haven't done a ton of, but I'd like to do more of playing in atypical locations. So even here, we've been moving around a lot um, and just sort of, uh, what's it like to play on this empty building? What's it like to play on this like raised position, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. Um, and again, I think there's something to just getting a sense of place uh, that seems to me, I experience as being more effective than like walking and looking. So to go big on, on one of these questions, so um, something that I kind of think about a lot is the, the aperture of now. Um, and we've not, I don't think, explicitly talked about this, but you were talking about the aperture of location. Mm. So like, so like in terms of dimensionality, there is a place that you traverse either physically in disc golf or um, maybe uh, conceptually or aesthetically in terms of improvisation here. Like there is a place that you are negotiating um, and similarly, there is a time that is negotiated by definition and improvisation. Like you, you occupy the moment in which, in which you're also creating and experiencing the things. Um, how do these two apertures relate to each other? Do they relate to each other? And specifically your relationship to them. Like how do you negotiate now and where? Right. Yeah. Well, it's, it's interesting. Um, I mean, uh, I'm always... Uh, uh, a little bit reticent to bring up, uh, like, for example, my meditation practice. I've meditated um, for the last 10 years uh, on an ex a very regular basis. Um, and that's just kind of a fact to me, right, uh, in the same way that I've eaten every day of my life, pretty much, uh, and I'm fortunate to have done that. Um, that's just a fact. Um, but one of the things about meditating that I've just, has become part of the equation for me is um, getting used to like a multiple headspace, right? So having wandering thoughts or um, impulses like I'm hungry or I'm kind of tired right now or I have to do this today or any of this kind of bullshit um, and then having a relationship to that so that you are not um, wholly preoccupied with that thing, right? There are other... Um, 
spaces right to occupy um, so I think very similarly when one is improvising I mean you're thinking about um, aesthetic things you're not thinking at all right you're just listening and processing your way if you're playing with someone else you're listening to and thinking about them you're recalling things you've done and ha sometimes in a very um, concerted right reflective kind of way and sometimes in a sort of impulse kind of way where um, out of nowhere you recollect something you did two minutes ago and you bring it back as a unanticipated sort of structural uh, moment of significance right? um, so point being is the aperture of now as I experience it is something that I experience in a variety of spaces and in many ways the playing space isn't different, right? Um, it's a negotiation between, oh, I'm hungry, or oh, like, I'm getting bored with this thing, or like, oh, I really, um, I'm stuck in a place, and like, I kind of want to get out of this physical situation or sonic situation so I can do something that I think is more worthwhile, but like, I have to like, do it in a non-crappy way, right, or at least try to, um, this kind of thing. So these are all just like basic human things that I think then feed into the sound making and the sound experiencing and the sound considering. Um, but I also do think that um, the act of playing itself huh, becomes a uh, cognitive metronome that demarcates time in a very step-by-step -step way that uh, is very difficult to do without an activity that anchors you to the moment, right? Um, so playing not is only like about the moment, um, but becomes a mechanism uh, through which you attend more to the moment and all that it entails physically, conceptually, emotionally, socially, whatever the case may be, right? So we were talking earlier about playing as a active way to experience a place. I think this is where that starts to tie in because you're attending to an activity that, that uh, you have to re-attend to from one discrete aperture uh, to the next, right? Um, so it becomes this, uh, uh, this it, it's a funnel, right? Um, like the now like is always a funnel for all this stuff. Um, but you, I feel like one becomes acutely aware of that. Um, and all this sounds really mental, right? Or really like uh, conceptual. Um, but I, I don't necessarily think that one experiences it that way. Right, you're just kind of doing a thing, <laughs> and you kind of keep doing it. If you'd like to support the making of these videos, please join our Patreon. The link is in the description below. Thanks for watching.